Lord's Day 41, question 108 reads, What does the seventh commandment teach us? That all unchastity is accursed of God, and that we must, therefore, detest it from the heart, and live a chaste and content life, both within and outside of holy wedlock. Does God in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and such like gross sins? Since our body and soul are both temples of the Holy Spirit, it is his will that we keep both pure and holy. Wherefore, he forbids all unchaste actions, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice one there too. I just draw attention to those words there, whatever may entice one there too. The commandments of the Lord remind us that we are to live prudent lives, wise lives, and especially here with regard to the seventh commandment as well. Well, now, congregation, let's open the Holy Scriptures to Matthew chapter 5, and then we'll open up to 2 Samuel, where we'll gain our context. So let us first open up to Matthew chapter 5, and starting with reading with verse 27. Remember, our Lord here is on the Sermon on the Mount, and he is transforming the Ten Commandments as the new Moses, as the great prophet that our Lord is, as he is God manifested in the flesh. Uh, some have described this transformation, not something new in the sense that it wasn't there originally, but some have described it this way, that what our Lord is teaching here is we're moving from black and white television to color. We're going from black and white television to HD TV 1080p. We're looking at a clear exposition of the law of God as given by our Lord Jesus Christ. So we read, begin reading at verse 27 of Matthew chapter 5. We read to verse 30. Again, Matthew chapter 5, we start reading with verse 27. You have heard that it was said, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 29, our Lord begins to expound how we are then to react to such lust. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Our Lord says that in order to beat this issue of fornication, adultery, this lust that arises in the heart, there must be a radical reaction to it. We must not pander to it. We must not acquiesce to it. We must not justify it in any sense of that term. This is hyperbolic language, obviously, to bring forth how radical it needs to be done in the heart to be cut out, to be excised in every which way. And so now, congregation, let's turn to 2 Samuel as we gain our context of, with regard to adultery, gaining some thoughts and concerns about this important seventh commandment in the life of David as he committed adultery with Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read verses 1 through 5. Here is the reading of God's word. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. 
And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. She became, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. The woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Well, may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Well, congregation, the scriptures teach us that every Christian, everyone who's been born again, everyone who's been regenerate, is a person who's under construction by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. We're not there yet. We're a work in progress. Every believer is legally righteous before God, being justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Yet at the same time, he still remains a sinner in battle against his sinful desires. The Apostle Paul states this spiritual battle most fervently in Romans chapter 7. Verse 18, when he said, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. The spiritual battle touches every aspect of life as it relates to the seventh commandment. There is no greater example than David's sin of adultery in 2 Samuel 11. Before we delve into some of the practicalities of that chapter and the teaching there, let's understand the context just a little bit. In 2 Samuel 11, David was around 40 years old and very skillful. He was, in sort, a national hero. We are told in, 2 Samuel, or in 1 Samuel 23 that David had a good relationship with the Ammonites and especially King Nahash. When Haman, his son, had come to power after Naaman's death, Haman rose up against Israel by aligning himself with Assyria. He insulted David, he insulted the nation of Israel, and David sent men to war led by Joab. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 14, we read that Israel was defeated by, or had defeated the Assyrians, sending them north, and the Ammonites were sent back to their capital city of Rabbah. So again, David defeats his enemies. He defeats the Assyrians, sending them north. He defeats the Ammonites and their new king by sending them back to their capital city of Rabbah. Because the coming of winter was coming fast, David waited till the spring to finally defeat the Ammonites, which is recorded in chapter 11, verse 1. Yet in the midst of this great national celebration, again, David kills his tens of thousands. He's a national hero. In every which way, publicly, he is a man to be esteemed and honored. In the midst of great national celebration, David suffers a personal defeat by committing adultery and murder. And today we look at the seventh commandment, you shall not murder, through this incident. My intent is not to be exhaustive, but applicatory. What were the contributing factors to David's life that brought him to this point? What was the slippery slope that he was on? And how can we learn from this incident for ourselves so that we can detect the signs of 
the slippery slope in our own life. We have to admit that all of us are in one sense are on that slippery slope. Sexual passion of any sort can come up from behind us in many different ways. We find ourselves entrapped in the devil's sewer, which brings us down greatly. Our subject is, take heed, lest you fall. We just have two sermon points. First, the cultural influence. And second, the prosperity or successful influence. These are two signs that you know you're going to be in trouble if you become insensitive to these signs. One, the cultural influence, and then also prosperity and success. So first, the first contributing sign is the cultural influence that often leads to sexual sin. We see this here in the example of David because he allowed himself to be dragged away from the things that are pleasing to God. From the principles laid down in God's word to be entrapped in committing adultery. I'm sure that it wasn't evident to him at the time, but each day and month and year, David was falling into the trap of Satan to commit adultery. This is Satan's main work in our life, to slowly seduce us away from walking in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you've heard of the example of the frog in the pot, right? You know, the frog is in a pot of cold water and he's having a great time in there. And you just turn the heat up slowly and slowly and slowly until the frog is belly up dead. And the frog never knew what hit him. That's the way in which the devil seduces people. David's family life is not what it should be. His example as a father is not what it should be. And Satan is using all these elements to bring David into the situation that he's into now. David's first problem was his polygamous lifestyle, which was a direct attack on the institution of marriage. This taking of many wives that David did was a direct violation of God's word, particularly the seventh commandment, as it is established from Genesis chapter 2, that the two shall become one. It doesn't say in the nine shall become one. It says and the two should become one. This polygamous lifestyle of David was driven by culture, the culture of the day. To view marriage just simply in the light of culture is all what David was doing. But it was driving him away from God, driving him away from God's word. Since everyone was doing it, Satan's untrue exaggeration, which is prevalent today, It's okay to do it. Why not indulge? Ashley Madison, right? The website. Commit adultery. Life is short. It's satanic seduction. All too often, this is Satan's trick for us today as well. You see, this is our problem today. The problem is not the church, as we have often said, that exists in the world, but too much of the world is found in the church. There's a huge difference between the world and culture and the church of Jesus Christ. The two are totally different. The invisible church is identified as the people of God, God's elect, from whom Christ purchased with his own blood and is continually cleansing her by both the Spirit and the Word. 
such things are never said of the world or of our culture in which we live. Like David, whether we know it or not, our culture pushes us constantly to conform to its principles rather than to Christ's. It seeks to drive us away from Christ by taking our hearts away from his word. I'll never forget the time a, a prostitute had came up to me and she solicited me and I said to her, no ma'am, I could not do that against God. Well, what makes you any different than anybody else? She said. You see, the culture with all of its perversion is pushing us to assimilate, to compromise the truth of God's word, especially about sexuality. The sewer that flows from Hollywood goes into almost every aspect of media is seeking to redefine the family and sexuality from homosexuality to fornication. While we decry against that, we realize that that's the way the world is. And while we cry to God in prayer over such perversion, from homosexuality to fornication to adultery and a whole bunch of other slew to pornography itself. We mourn over that, but that's the way the world is. That's not the way we should be as the people of God. Just like, just like in David's day, our culture seeks to drag us away from the forms of devotion, purity, and chastity, and commitment to our wives and to our husband. We admit that sexual desire is not an evil desire. But when it is detached from Christ in love, when it is detached from Christ in devotion and commitment, then it is attack upon God and his institution of marriage. Commitment? Loyalty? In our culture? Where do you find that? seems like it's all gone out the door. Commitment to our employer. Commitment to the sports team to whom we're under contract with. Even that's under fire, right? Well, I don't want to negotiate my contract. Throw the old contract out, comes a new one. Commitment? Our culture doesn't even know how to spell the word commitment and loyalty anymore. Doesn't want it. But we are to be different. You see, polygamy here fostered a slippery slope to openness, which has encouraged the lust for a variety of sexual experiences. Sexual desire today, as in David's time, is not directed to devotion and commitment, but to a variety of experiences. While well, the impact of polygamy is not a great concern in our culture. The social and psychological factor of a variety of sexual experiences is projected all over the place. The idea of self-satisfaction of sexuality that is isolated from true love and devotion, that is isolated from commitment, is the attitude today. And that's the link between us and, and David's day. As in David's day, so in our culture, there is a confusion about the whole issue of love and commitment. I don't know how many wives and husbands look at their spouse and say, are you committed to me? The way that Christ is committed to the church? That's our example. That's our standard. Not the lowest standard. Away with the lowest standard. 
You see, the only way to combat the slide into this perversion, to this openness idea, is to meditate and keep ever before us the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a polygamist. For he has one bride, the church, who he loves and gave himself for. Jesus loves the church so much that he died for her and continually cleanses her from the filth of the world. Husbands, are you doing that to your wife? Wives, are, do you love your wife, your husband that way? Jesus is devoted, committed to his church by protecting, guarding, and feeding her. Like Christ to the church, we need to also be committed to our marriages. No wonder Jesus says in hyperbolic language, if your eye is offended, you pluck it out. Whatever happened to that standard? We need to be brutally honest, congregation, about our own weaknesses. Especially men. You know, preachers always go after women all the time. It just seems to be my experience. They love to go after women. But especially men. God hasn't called you to act like a pig. God has called you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Men, you need to be sensitive to inappropriate relationships, physically and emotionally. Whether it be pornography on the internet or some other evil thing. Our culture wants to destroy God's institution of marriage. Wants to redefine it. The concept of Christ-centered love and commitment must be evident in our thought, word, and deed because we are temples of the Holy Spirit, body and soul, and God wants to keep clean and holy. So that's the first sign. The sign of slipping into adulterous actions and heart evidenced in actions in life. Of acquiescing to culture. The second warning sign of many that we could have used is with regard to sexual perversion, with regard to prosperity or success. See, prosperity and success, or success, often leaves us open to sexual perversion. Again, we see this in the example of David. David is a national hero. He is the man. Remember that in the ancient Near East, kings had sovereign rule over everything, especially their people. The concept is found maybe in the Latin phrase, rex est lex. The king is law. The ruler was above the law. David was clearly adopting this idea in his heart. David's adultery it is evident because he began to rule like other kings. This is not only spelled out in David's adultery in verses 1 through 4, but also in the deliberate cover-up and murder of Uriah. He doesn't seem to fear anybody. He's the king. We see that both prosperity and success, or success, was warping David's mind in actions in at least two ways. First, prosperity and success often gives us too much time on our hands. Verse 1. But David remained at Jerusalem. Ominous words. David's sin did not just suddenly appear in a moment of time. David set himself up for this fall by stirring, as it were, the devil's brew. 
We know that David disengaged himself from the battle, choosing instead a life of comfort and ease. Isn't that what king, kings don't go out to fight? They stay home and relax. Let their generals take care of things. These words, but David remained in Jerusalem, ought to strike us as rather odd. See, David's reputation was much like General Patton's. David was known for being with his soldiers in battle. Patton was often like that. He would walk alongside his troops. He'd become one with them. Yet here we see David pulling back because apparently there was more important things to do than being with his troops. From our text, David's prosperity, his, his hero status, his, his success gives him time to possibly cultivate evil desires. It is here that we learn that idleness often leads to problems. You know the phrase, idle hands is the devil's workshop. There are many variations, but they all follow the same theme. A person who doesn't have something particular to occupy himself with will be tempted to occupy himself with sin. You got too much time on your hands if you're watching pornography on the internet. Nobody watches pornography for 10 minutes on the internet. All the statistics point to the fact they spent several hours on the internet. Too much leisure time. Often, not always, can only lead to trouble. We see this in the words of verse 2 as David is walking on the roof of his house and saw a woman bathing. Lust is burning with inside of him. You see, when we get a roaming eye like David in verse 2, it leads us to the watching of pornography and finding fulfillment in other things other than Jesus Christ. Sexual lust begins in the heart, as our Lord taught in Matthew 5. But it is brought in and stimulated to the eyes. And again, men, that points to you and me. David reminds us in our text that especially men are more sexually attracted to what they see. Men must be careful and wise because the eyes are the gate by which sexual perversion comes into the heart. Some great painters in history have painted people or individuals and they often put gates on the eyes because that's the truth. That the eyes are gates by which sexual per perversion comes into the heart, but there are also gates to stop sexual perversion from coming into the heart. You see, prosperity and success, again, not always, means that we have too much time on our hands, but secondly, it also breeds the idea of arrogance in the heart. Independence. Self-made man. We all want to be financially stable because it makes us independent. We don't have to worry about things. We don't have to worry about being dependent. And so when prosperity and success often comes into the heart, not always, it fosters the idea of prayer and arrogance. And while there's nothing wrong with being prosperous or successful, some people can't handle it. And they mishandle it. How many have said, no, not me? 
Or, no way, I'm spiritually mature. I'll never fall into that lust that David did. No way, not me. It's hard to believe that David would become so enticed, so en engulfed, so in bondage. Because of his past relationship with God was, was so vibrant and so real. David was, a, was, in a sense, a great theologian as well as an intimate relationship with the Lord God. How could this happen to David? David? He's so spiritually mature. How do we, how do we know that? That he was so spiritually mature, that he, that he, that he had such good theology. Because it's all recorded in the Psalms, is it not? During the time David was running from Saul, was seeking to kill him, those lonely days and nights in the cave, he was an example of humility and prayer, dependence upon God. Like in Psalm 86, verse 1, Lord, listen to me and answer me. I am poor and helpless. Something's changed in David's life at this point. Prosperity often leaves us exposed to Satan. And David's in that situation. And while there's much discussion on the words in verse 3, David sent and inquired about the woman. Whatever position you take, one point is clear. David is full of himself and is red hot with lust, to say the least. David is so prideful and arrogant that he does not seek to hide the affair as he commands his messengers to go and take her. The Hebrew word there is seize her. Whether she wants to come or not, I'm the king. And in the ancient Near East, you do what the king says to do. And they go. Notice how the messengers help. They aid and abet in David's adultery. David uses intimidation. It reminds us of those words in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Now Nathan will come soon to say, thou art the man. But notice how the messengers don't say to David, Oh, David, stop doing what you're doing. You cannot do that. People fall to the side because they're intimidated by David. Instead of giving him the truth, they fall to the side. And what it is, they ate in a bet. In other words, what King David wants, he gets. Otherwise, you may just lose your head. Notice David's lust makes him insensitive to God, who watches over all things. Was it not David who wrote in Psalm 69, verse 5, Oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are, are not hidden from you. God's there. God's watching. He's become so insensitive because of his pride and his arrogance. No, not me. Just say this by passing that there's no possible way Bathsheba is to blame. Bathsheba is a victim of abuse of power. Make no mistake about it, as Nathan said to David, you are the man. A man seeking to satisfy his own desires over God's word and authority. David is an example of warning to all of us, but especially men, to pay attention to the early warning signs of Satan's seduction away from God and his word. You see, prosperity and success is really a gift of God. But when it is not defined or confined by God's word, it often leads to disaster. Many say, if I can achieve success, my problems would go away. The reality is that success 
creates a whole new set of problems. I was talking one time to a pretty affluent man. And he told me that when you didn't have two nickels to rub together, life was pretty much simple. But now that he has so much money, he can't even count the money he had. Life becomes very complex. Because there's always somebody who wants to take that money. And there's always ways to lose the money. And to be imprudent about it. See, success creates a whole new set of problems that we didn't even think were coming. That's why in many sense I just say, Lord, keep me just as a common preacher. Bless the ministry of your word. May the name of Jesus be lifted up in the hearts of your people. May people be converted. But keep me here in Carbondale. There's something good about creaky pews and floors. You see, for every Christian in this sex-soaked sex culture, our battle against temptation never ceases. We need people around us to give us good wisdom who are not afraid of my face or your face, who will stand up and say, that's wrong. And when the person raises his ire against you and say, Give me a biblical verse that says that. We will look at him and say that the seventh commandment requires you to be different than the world. We have all lusted in our hearts for other women and for men. Let us be honest about that. Let us be honest about our own weaknesses. But let us not be dismayed, but know that the Lord Jesus is the substance of the law. Yes, we have fallen. We haven't been the wife or the husband that we have should have been. Yes, we haven't been as pure as we are called to be. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. So let us go to the cross and be washed. Let us find our comfort in that and, and raise up saying that I'm still under construction to fight against our culture and from the pride and arrogance that so easily brings us down. Let us find comfort in our Lord Jesus Christ who is the pure one, who is the Holy One of Israel, who has come to free us from our sexual stupor. May we be like Joseph when Potiphar's wife came to him, seducing him to have sex. No, I cannot do this against God. That's our standard. Jesus is the pure one. You see, it's in the Lord Jesus who is our bridegroom. And we are his bride in the new covenant. That's where our standard should be. You see, congregation, we need our hearts washed in true repentance and faith. In a counter-cultural way, Christ's transforming power enables us to see other persons who bear the image of God as persons and not merely as sexual objects. Let us remember that although the love that we have and we're called to have in this life and marriage fades away in time. But the love of our union with Christ grows brighter and brighter with age. Let us be warned. Let us be warned. That no fornicator or adulterer shall inherit the kingdom of God. And as the scriptures remind us, for without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. May God bless the preaching of his word.
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in times when we struggle with loving our spouse, even at times when we become selfish and arrogant, even in times when we become swayed by the culture in which we live in, there is always Jesus there. To remind us of his love for the church. That's where our standard is. And we need to be reminded of that. That the standard is greater than just simply the marriage that we have with our spouse. The love that we are to emulate is the love that Christ has for the church. And that the church has for Christ. And help us as men, Lord. Because too many times we play naive. In one sense, we, we play stupid to our own weaknesses. And then find ourselves in the same situation David did. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Put them under the blood of Jesus. And raise us up in the newness of life that's found in him alone. Bind us together in your love. Renew our hearts. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.